टेली मेडिसिन के उससे ही हो रहा है इनका ये उधर से वो लोग कर रहे हैं
हमें कोरोना ने जगाया वो लोग पहले से करें वहाँ मरीज नहीं आता वो घर पे बैठ के टीवी स्क्रीन मेरे सब दोस्त जो हैं आज से सात आठ साल से करते हैं बैठते हैं वाशिंगटन डीसी में करते हैं सिंसिनाटी में बोले भैया पैसा मिल रहा है तो क्यों ना करें पर काम ज्यादा होता है वहाँ पता है आपको उससे उसमें ज्यादा मेहनत करनी पड़ती है पेशेंट के नोट करने पड़ते हैं चलो शुरुआत करें कहाँ है हाँ गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबडी ऑन ऊना Okay, so this is the lecture on amenorrhea and hirsutism. It is a one hour. Sorry, there was a slight delay because of some technical problems that we are facing here. So this is a one hour lecture, but for the topic is too vast, and I think I would try to do justice. Maybe if you go a little longer by an hour, I'm sure you'll be able to tolerate me because the two subjects itself are very, very exhaustive and long. So let's move on to the first topic, which is amenorrhea. Now, by definition, amenorrhea means that there is no bleeding or no menses. that are supposed to happen in a woman or a adolescent girl uh, by means by simple this definition being absence or f- uh, menses or an abnormal sen- uh, cessation that means there were periods happening and they suddenly stopped because if it is absent from the beginning it would be mean a primary amenorrhea but somebody who's having periods and suddenly stops it's called secondary amenorrhea we'll come to on that later So basically, it could be physiological. That means part of a physiology. I e suppose she's pregnant. She's not supposed to have periods. That will be what is called as a physiological amenorrhea. But most of the patients who are having a problem or an etiology or a pathology there is what is a pathological amenorrhea. So having said that, both in the terms of physiology, the common situations that we know in physiology, somebody who has gone, who has not attained puberty, it's a pre-pubertal girl. Obviously, that's physiology, and of course, somebody. who by physiology stops having her ovarian functions or the ovaries die out in the physiology has menopause is another situation now among the pathological as i said will be a primary or a secondary amenorrhea primary meaning that somebody who's had periods or was uh, was never started having periods is the one who is primary but somebody who started having periods but because of some pathology stops having periods is what is secondary amenorrhea now in primary amenorrhea is somebody who has not now what is the age at which we, until what we should call a, a, a young adolescent girl or a young girl as having primary amenorrhea that means she's never started never initiated menarche and that is if she has reached the age of 16 with the normal secondary sexual characters that is the way we would define it so that means if it is a young girl who doesn't who has a normal secondary sexual characteristics i.e. she has attained normal height the growth spurt is good she's got breast and pubic and axillary hair developed but until 16 years she does not get periods that's what is primary amenorrhea however if she does not have secondary sexual characters developing that means there is absence of breast development there is absence of pubic hair in those case we take the cut off age as earlier being 14 years now secondary amenorrhea by definition is somebody who has had established menses but they do not happen or have ceased to take place for at least 6 months and after 6 months is the time that we take for cut off to call it as secondary amenorrhea now uh, as i said by definition sorry it is not 14 it's 13 so 13 years is when she's got no visible development of secondary sexual characters and 15 years is what is the definition from the recent um, uh, you know the latest that i could look up so the definitions here are in, in a little variable between 13 in fact for 14 and 16 now it's 13 and 4 15 years by the definition so these will keep coming and keep changing so you'll have to really keep ourselves on updated but that's not a big issue now uh, <coughs> why they have decreased uh, uh, was decreased and the reason here i tell you is the ages defining primary were decreased by one year to continue to represent two standard deviations of the mean age of developing secondary sexual characteristics so it's a little bit of statistics here so you reduce it by one year because you want to take uh, represent the two standard deviations above the mean age now we should really understand what puberty is puberty is basically a spurt of uh, is a physiological change which takes place or which evolves so it's not one point time it's a gr- it's a continuum of a process where there is a physiology which takes place to attain full reproductive capability of a, 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 of a woman in her, in, her, in her whole career in her uh, age of uh, growing and the sequence that is really known as we really understand is is, is initially a growth spurt because of the influence of the uh, reproductive hormones including estrogens when uh, acting with the growth hormone with the whole pituitary and the hypothalamic gamut and I'll explain you that later with thylaki so the breast buds which is thylaki corresponds to the development of breast buds and followed by a pubarchy or adrenarchy and that is the growth of pub- pubic and the axillary hair followed by menarche so menarche is the ultimate culmination in the process of physiology of puberty now 
in approximately 20% Adrenaki may precede Thilaki. So this is the sequence. It doesn't mean it's going to follow the norm. There may be slight variation, and the variation that has been reported in literature is that 20% people or 20% of young girls may have the development of pubic and axillary here before the breast bud starts initiating. So this is a bit of physiology. Now, as I would say that there is a whole play of the uh, the, the endocrine uh, system, but then there's a paracrine system also involved. And of course, a lot of influences which we understand are the environmental, i.e. there'll be environmental factors like obesity and, and some kind of you know ethnicities which are there, uh, which you would say, which have a small play or small interplay to control the CNS. Uh, and that's why you know women or young girls who are obese tend to have uh, an early onset of, um, uh, of, of uh, puberty or menarche because the leptin levels in their body are higher. But how I all said and done, it is the, the whole system that you all understand from the physiology as you have read in the first year would be the CNS, where the hypothalamus governs in the master uh, computer, takes charge uh, through the GnRH pulses on the anterior pituitary, and the anterior pituitary are the one released gonadotrophins, FSH, and LH, and which goes on to act on the ovary. And in the ovary, it is, we know that they are the, the development of the, 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 the graphene follicles, and of course, the theca cells and the granulosa cells, which in turn go on to release estrogen progesterones, which are acting on the end organ, which is the uterus, and thereby bring about menses or periods. Now, what are the causes of primary amenorrhea? Because we're talking about pathological now, because physiology is what we understand. Uh, so we have to understand that it will be according to the level which the disease is or the problem is. So if you go from bottom up, it will be either the genital tract, which is the end organs, which is uh, the uterus or the outflow tract, which is the vagina, which is affected. Above that is the ovary. Um, above that is the anterior pituitary. And finally, it is the hypothalamus or the CNS system. That's how things go on in the system when we really want to try it and find what the cause is in our patients. Now, I would come back to this slide again. Again, it looks a little crowded. And I have taken from a book called Dewhurst's textbook of obstetrics and gynecology, which is one of my most favorite books as a postgrad. It may be a little old, but still I would say for a postgraduate, one of the most uh, finest book ever come from a British writer and of course this is crowded but if you really want to say there's just one simple thing to this classification and that is whenever you get a case of primary amenorrhea just concentrate whether there is development of secondary sexual characters yes or no and secondly what is the height and I would say these two things are first or paramount in basically reaching a diagnosis and a lot can really come from this a bit of history that you get and and I think this two, these two points in the examination are very, very sacrosanct. So if you look on the left side, and if you could see the slide, see secondary sexual characters present and secondary sexual characters absent. So since this is just in our class, I would really concentrate on the salient causes of primary amenorrhea. I will not really go on to the finer ones, which I think my postgraduates will always read. But if you look at it, and if you have these slides, you can always download or go to the textbook of Dewhurst and see them. If there's a secondary sexual character present, i.e. that girl has attained thilake, adrenake, and has not achieved menarche, then you have to think first and foremost is a constitution delay. I.e. it is a later fate. Maybe she is, has got all the system in place, but constitutionally there's a delay. And we do get girls and mothers getting apprehensive that at the age of 17 she's not had periods. We just have to just give them some bit of reassurance and that's it. But then the next cause is in a woman who or in a young girl who gets uh, secondary sexual characters would, uh, would be, and that is with a normal height, would be an anatomical. An anatomical means we are looking at the end organs, i.e. there is an imperforate hymen, which means that there is a tract outflow tract obstruction or a transverse vaginal septum. Because if you look, recall, the Mullerian systems, when they develop in utero, it is the uh, Wolfian, uh, it, it is, uh, the Wolfian system which goes from the male reproductive tracts and in the females is the Mullerian system which takes to form the female tracts and there is the uh, fusion this is occurring somewhere between the 11th to the 13th week uh, of uh, in intrauterine life that the sinovaginal bulbs fuse with the Mullerian systems to uh, align in, in, in vertically and therefore when the sinovaginal bulb fuses this which is responsible for the formation of the vagina with the Mullerian systems forming the uterus and the fallopian tubes, when they get together, the sinovaginal plate, uh, which, which kind of dissolves somewhere by the 16th week, there is a continuum from the Mullerian system to the vagina, and therefore this is what needs uh, to be understood. That somewhere when this development fails at the transverse level, that means the sinovaginal bulb does not uh, get perforated in the normal process, it could lead to the development of transverse vaginal septums, and at all times a lot of these girls may even have cervical atresias. So that is an anatomical category, which is a whole class in itself. 
The other being the Mullerian Rokitansky Kusna Haza syndrome, and I'll tell all of these in detail because these are common causes. And of course, when there are secondary sexual characters, you must think of an XY female, that is androgen insensitivity syndrome. Now, these are the three ones where you would have a young girl presenting with primary amenorrhea, i.e., she doesn't have periods until the age of 16 or 15, as the new definition would say, or maybe till whatever age that we look at, 16, 17. But the secondary sex characters are present, so the things would hover around an XY female, which is though less common, commonest would be a constitutional delay. So look into the height and ask for secondary sexual characters. A very important catch whenever you get these girls is examination. Never examine them in the absence of a chaperone. It's always best an idol to have her mother or her parent or her guardian to be there when you're examining. Now, this is one point which is very important. Now, coming to the group where you know the secondary sexual characters are absent, i.e. there is no development of breast, the pubarche, uh, the pubarche have, um, uh, adrenarche has not taken place. There is where lies the importance of concentrating on the height because we know that if the stature is short, then we we know that we're going to look and that's low down. If you look in the in the uh, in the uh, causes there, if it's a short stretch, obviously you you go first and jump to say a Turner syndrome. But let's look at when they have a normal stature, they don't have secondary sexual character they bring. The causes could be again top down. It's a hypo hypo, which is we call as a HH syndrome, hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. And these are young girls which are rarely seen in the pediatric endocrinology, more commonly referred from them. And that's when there's a deficiency, which could be because of an isolated GNRH deficiency. That means the hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism is isolated. And also is, is something which is included is uh, the olfactory syndrome, which you call as a Kalman syndrome, which is a variant of the hypo hypo. Uh, and I'm sure you all have read this. Moving on there would be the acquired group, would be some girls who are particularly anorexic, where there's a history of weight loss, and of course, we do get it, not so common now. I think the uh, couple of years back, we used to get a lot of young girls where she's a gymnast, she's uh, working a lot on her body, she has to maintain a low weight, and she's also exercising. So that's typically when they have, uh, do not get periods, and that's it a quiet variant of a hypo hypo that means once they're off that diet once they're off their exercise schedules the the acquired variant of uh, hh or the hypo hypo goes off the other bit is in a normal stature could be hypo hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism that's the other side of the story hypo means that because of the uh, you know isolated deficiencies of the hypothalamic system the gnrh pulses are weakened and therefore the fsh lh are the ones which are not coming up the other side of the story is hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism, which means that there is a higher levels of FSH LH instead of a lower levels. And this is peculiarly seen with which you have what is called as an ovarian failure. So I know it's going to be a little busy here, but I will keep coming back to this. Of course, if it's just short stretcher, the first diagnosis is the Turner syndrome. There could be trauma, tumors, and empty cella. Uh, so uh, we'd, and of course, the heterosexual development is that means there is uh, typically uh, presence of um, a true homophobite or a congenital adrenal hyperplasia or androgen secreting syndrome. That means they they have got development of the female, uh, you know, um, characteristic. But besides that, they have either clitoral enlargement or they have presence of a penis-like structure there around, and therefore they give a heterosexual development. So these are some of the causes. So coming back here on the etiology, if I really ramp, sum it up, what are the common etiologies? Uh, of a group of primary amenorrhea as has been looked up. I think the most common abnormality, this was a study from the American Journal, and I think it's really nice, which says of all the young girls which were analyzed, they had some form of chromosomal abnormality, including an XY female, to hypo-hypo, which was seen in 20%. Mullerian agenesis is seen in 15%, and of course, this Mullerian agenesis and the transfer septum contributing to the anatomic variant. The pituitary disease in 5% and some others which are including the can androgen uh, congenital androgen hyperplasia in just 5%. Now this is something which is coming from American data. If we look at Indian, perhaps these figures may not be very, very true. Uh, however, we may be slightly different from them. So let's look at the girls, which is the first category. As I said in this, uh, secondary sexual characters are present. That's the first group. And therefore, if we look at the secondary sexual characters are present, you have to do in a girl not just uh, the, the the evaluation of the height, but you just have to do an examination. What is it? It is a local exam, um, and 
I think, as I said, should always be done with the presence of a, of, of, of a guardian. So what you'd look at is, is the vagina blind or absent? That's the first thing. Because if the vagina is absent or blind, there could be two variants. That means either she has symptoms, and the typical symptoms she'll have, she gets cyclical tum pains. She's got lower abdominal pains, which is very cyclical, and that is somewhere pointing you to a, a, a girl who has had a secondary sexual catheters dealt with at a normal time, i.e. there is obstruction. That means her uterus is functioning. Therefore, in response to the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, which is intact, the uterus is responding to the estrogen progesterone being produced and therefore there is development of the cyclical lining of the endometrium which gets shed off in response to the ovarian or the um, menstrual cycle but then this periods or the flow which is happening to be let out is not getting the opportunity to come out and therefore this is where there is an anatomical outlet obstruction and therefore these girls have typically cyclical pain which gets worsened over the years because there's a backflow and therefore this commonest reason would be an imperforate hymen. That means there's a hymen which has not got perforated and this is typically seen with a girl who comes with a history. Also in transverse vaginal septums, the history would be typically of cyclical abdominal pain. Now, there could be another side where you have, uh, she has got a blind vagina or an absent vagina and she's absolutely asymptomatic. And the asymptomatic variants would be the ones where you have to really jump in to see how is the pubic hair or the ancillary hair. Now, if the pubic hair are normal, that's another way to sort of examine, complete your examination and try your girls. If they were normal pubic hair development, this is, could be appointed to Mullerian agenesis. That means the Mullerian agenesis, i.e. the mare Rokitansky syndrome or its variants where the Mullerian symptoms are failing to develop. That means the, pitu the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis are perfectly normal, but the end organs are missing. And if the uterus is absent, obviously, there will be no response and therefore they shall have primary amenorrhea. Now a similar presentation could be a, a girl who is asymptomatic, has a blind vagina but then the variant is androgen insensitivity and what is the clinching uh, feature where you can differentiate always the line of demarcation is there is absence of pubic hair because here these are XY females and because they have uh, insensitivity to the androgen receptors even if the androgen is present these androgen hormones or the testosterone is not able to act on the receptors and therefore they do not get pubic care. But there will be tall, beautiful girls will have the presence of uh, breast development because the hormone androgen gets converted in the periphery to estrogens and that's leading to the development of the breast as well. But if the axillary hair are absent and then you must look in. However, the confirmation will come on a, a carotidal typing but these are the possibilities that one have to keep in mind with this flow chart which is simple to remember. So what is uh, the anatomical causes that we know? As I said, it could be an outflow tract um, obstruction in, in perforate hymen or a transverse vaginal septum. <clears throat> also, as I said, in the development of the Mullerian system in utero, it could be cervical uh, atresia or congenital absence of the cervix or also dysgenesis. Uh, by my mean, what dysgenesis means there's a faulty development. The cervix is either formed and is failing to communicate with the sinovaginal bulb, which is um, forming the vagina. And of course, the more common variety that we see is MRKH, which is a Mullerian agenesis story where the MRKH syndrome means there is absence of development of the Mullerian systems. So the commoner ones that I will highlight because we don't have time enough to complete the entire discussion, I'll talk common ones are imperforate hymen and the MRKH, which are commonly seen. When you have primary amenorrhea, there is an outflow or an anatomical defect in a girl who does not have who has secondary sexual character and is standing of an, and standing tall to a normal height. So imperforate hymen, these are all the incidences that are given, one in a thousand to one in ten thousand wearing, depending on the uh, society which is coming. And as I told, typically, the, when there is an outflow obstruction, typical cyclical pelvic abdominal pain, and as the days or months go by, they start developing a lump, which could be present in some, not in all. Uh, also present sometimes with acute retention because there is uh, this, this collection which is happening in, in an imperforate hymen in the vagina which you call as a hematocolpos and when this hematocolpos grows big enough it could just press on the bladder and, and the urethra and cause symptoms from this distended vagina. So obviously the reason is very simple if you look at the uh, cause it's that the, the outflow, outflow of, uh, from the, uh, the, the, the hymen is, is, is not perforated so it's imperforate. At times you could even see a thin, and that's very peculiar, that you get a thin bulging perineal membrane which is blue. Blue because it's got collected blood behind it. And that's it. If you look at a picture like this, there could be an abdominal swelling or abdominal lump. 
And this is the picture which looks peculiar. You can see a bulging imperforate hymen which is bluish in color because it's got blood collected behind it. So what is the treatment? Very, very gratifying. It's simply just do a simple surgery in the form of a hymenotomy. That means you give an incision or a cut on the hymen and therefore a simple nick does wonders. You know, you see how, how thankful these young girls are and their mothers are because when you just put them under anesthesia, just give a small nick with a blade, the blood comes popping out and once they are relieved, the menstrual blood flow drains, you have nothing to do, just leave them and move ahead. So I'll come back to this, um, you know, this 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 uh, uh, classification as I always like it back again because I've already told you anatomical causes in the terms of an imperforate hymen or transvaginal septum. Similar presentation. The next on this list is MRKH, which is again an anatomical cause where uh, these girls present with primary amenorrhea. They have symmetrical breast development. The uh, the the pubic hair are there. Uh, their normal height, but what's very peculiar, they will have an absent or a blind vagina. And they have no symptoms of relevant to abdominal pain because they're not bleeding. The uterus is absent. Uh, sometimes there may be cyclical pains also, but that's very small percentage and that's when the uterus is very small. That like kind of a, a bulb-like uterus present. What's very peculiar to remember, and I'm sure you all can recall in the development that the uh, Wolfian systems and the Mullerian systems develop in tandem and in parallel when they're developing and therefore urological abnormalities are commonly seen in up to one third to one fourth of these girls. Uh, and therefore it becomes very important for us to screen them for uh, urological anomalies which could range from an absent kidney to a pelvic kidney to even a horseshoe shaped kidney to a double ureter. So all this kind of variance that you get. So it's very important when you get an MRKH, it's mandatory to complete the workup by doing the urinary uh, you know, evaluation by sending them for an ultrasound. And also important is to have this skeletal survey because there may be skeletal malformations in up to just uh, 5 to 12 percent of uh, these young girls. So what is there? You take a history. So she'll just give you a typical history, normal secondary sexual characters, normal height, but does not have periods. If you do an ultrasound, you'll have an absent uterus. That's how it, you get the diagnosis in, 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 in the day. But then don't come, just leave them to the pelvic ultrasound completed with a renal scan that means do a KUB ultrasound to look at the position and the absence of uh, kidneys. Spinal uh, evaluation by an x-ray, well you may have to resort them to an MRI abdomen, not very common if the ultrasound says absent there is no need, only those ones will give you atypical histories like some cyclical pain then you really need to be very sure. Of course very important is a karyotype because unlike an androgen insensitivity where the presentation can be confusing. Uh, particularly uh, when the ultrasound does not reveal, uh, because ultrasound is showing an absent uterus just to complete, because you want to dif distinguish them from an AIS, XY female, because the management becomes uh, different. And therefore, you have to get this karyotype, not just to diagnose an MRKH, but to distinguish it from an androgen insensitivity, you need to do a karyotype. So the tr what is the treatment when you have an MRKH? Well, of course, it's a lot of, a lot of psychological support is needed because this young girl and her mother or her guardian has to understand that she will not be able to bear a child from her own womb because, or from her own body. Now with IVF coming in, these girls can go in for a uterine transplant and the transplants that have been reported world over, which is of course not in the reach of majority of these young girls, uh, is, uh, have been done in situations of Mullerian agenesis. Even in India, uh, all the cases that have been reported for uterine transplant have been done for MRKH. Now, the treatment line is, again, you know, the treatment would be done between 17 to 20 years and for that matter, just before marriage in our situations, in our scenarios, because that's the time when Indian girls are getting sexually active. However, if the girl is wanting to be sexually active, as it happens in the West, the treatment starts earlier, as early as, you know, 13 to 14 years if they're diagnosed earlier. I mean, I could just put it as soon as they're diagnosed. And of course, the mainstay is surgery because what they need is to have a new vagina, creation of a vagina, uh, which would work as a conduit uh, for sexual activity because uh, that would be the, the mainstay of, of their surgery because they have an absent vagina. We can't create a uterus unless and until she goes in for a uterine transplant. So what are the methods to form the new vagina? It could be the methods are non-surgical and surgical. Now, a simple thing is just pelvic uh, dilation of the, the passages. And uh, we could just do it with simple dilators where she comes, and this is called an active and passive dilators, which are fantastically done in UK, where uh, in US, they are simple, called Ingram passive dilators. It's, 
it's kind of a tight um, in rem cycles bicycles where the girl sits on the cycle and takes up to two hours per day uh, and then uh, you know you, th there's a very uh, a dilator which is put in place she's been advised the place is identified and she sits on that bicycle does it for two hours on a racing bicycle and it's kind of a dilator which is on, on, on which she sits so she maintains that otherwise one could even do a simple dilatation going to a gynecologist or a nurse who could help them do dilation. Now this is something which is done very common in the West. We don't have experience because we don't have the kind of facility of that cycle and it's a little difficult to train our people because this could be a little traumatic. The other thing is surgical. Here you are dissecting the cavity which is between the rectum and the uh, urethra anteriorly and therefore you find a kind of a dissected space and in the space you line that space with either uh, a skin graft, which was in the original McIndoe's um, operation where they're taking split thickness graft from the thigh or from any other part of the skin and then putting it in that place that is a cavity that is dissected. Alternatively, there were dermis grafts and amnion grafts, but those, these things are rather now obsolete. What we are doing is that we are doing, uh, uh, we are lining it with uh, uh, some procedures like uh, putting, and because amnion has its own risk, may not have its risk of infection. And therefore, amnion and spl split uh, skin thickness grafts have given way to using simple things like uh, surgery cell, which is a methyl cellulose, like uh, 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 used uh, instead of putting it an amnion graft. So, uh, how can you do it? McIndoe's is a standard procedure. It could be even done by laparoscopy. <coughs> I uh, have not done a laparoscopic surgery in my career, but I've seen videos. It's a laparoscopic vecchettis and Davidoff's procedure. Again, these are for postgraduate, not for undergraduates. And we resort to uh, Williams Well, So these are just to complete the list. Uh, I'm sure if people who are pursuing uh, Obzengaini as their future speciality would really need that. So I'll come back to this again, and that is classification of primary neuro. Just to remind that we have completed the constitutional delay. We've gone and done the imperforate hymen, the transfer septum, and the MRKH. And of course, we have done of uh, to do with next is, is the XY female. If you look in the ones where the secondary sexual characters are present. And what is androgen insensitivity? Just to remind that uh, in the development, we know that if it is an XY male to develop, it will be in utero testes. That means that's a genetic uh, you know, makeup of uh, the fetus. And in such a situation, because it's testicles, there will be AMH, which is, uh, uh, will lead to uh, no malarian duct. So there's a regression in utero of the malarian duct system. And the hormones, the androgen response to that cause the development of male genitalia and the Wolfian ducts are the ones which are predominant. So the Mullerian are regressing in a female fetus, in a male fetus, and that's what is responsible for development of the male phenotype, including the development of uh, the penis and the scrotal uh, development in utero. Now, uh, in contrast to an ovary where there is absence of AMH, the apes in, in utero the AMH is missing, and therefore when there is no AMH means anti Mullerian hormone. That means it's anti to the Mullerian development. So in the ovary, there is no AMH. Therefore, the inhibition of the Mullerian ducts is not there because of the AMH. And this goes unchecked to lead the development of Mullerian ducts. But since there is no androgen in a female fetus in utero, there is no Wolfian duct development. And therefore, this leads to the development of female genitalia. So remember, for the development of a male genitalia in utero, you need testosterone and our androgens and the androgen receptors. So what happens in an XY female? There is no, a, there is AMH. So when the AMH is present, it doesn't lead to the development of Mullerian duct. So there's no uterus and no development of fallopian tubes and cervix. But the androgen which is coming, or there is, there is a deficiency of the receptor. So when the receptors are missing, there is no receptor present. There will be the testicles which are present there, which are generating androgens. But since the receptors are missing, the male phenotype will not develop, and therefore they will go on to develop a female phenotype. So this is the whole story, and that's the reason why NAIS develops. So typically, it is what is called as testicular feminization, but we have shifted to name that as AIS now. It's a 46XY. That means it's an, it's an XY female who looks like a female at birth, for obvious reasons that I have explained to you. Now, the external genitalia is of a female. She's generally absent cervix and uh, the, 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 the uterus and the cervix is absent because there is absence of the Mullerian developments. They have a blind uh, vagina or at times even short vagina. They have um, a developing of the breast at puberty because the androgens are getting converted in the periphery to estrogens. They may have, and since they have an XY genetic constitution, they have the presence of the testes. These testicles may be present at varying sites. 
uh, they could be present intra-abdominally or they could be partially descended into the inguinal canal. And more than 50% of them may have inguinal hernias at birth. In fact, that's a time where a lot of pediatric surgeons would actually get them to be identified as early as their infancy or childhood when they undergo an inguinal hernia surgery and they find the testicles lying within the inguinal canals and uh, a karyotype done that time or a little later identifies them as XY females. Now the presentation is primary amenorrhea. It could be as birth as I said in some of these cases or a childhood with an inguinal mass or hernia. Also there could be a family history, i.e. the siblings. And we've seen families where uh, in a family, the girls that are, are one child is normal but the other girls are also having. So it is and even seen in, in some kind of, in, in some groups of uh, dizygotic twins as well, though they are dizygotic. So uh, the diagnosis is history, of course, uh, where there's amenorrhea, but examination will be a tall female which has secondary sexual characters are present, and there is presence of, a, or there's an absence of a vagina, which is absent. If you're going to do their hormone levels, they will show elevated or normal levels of uh, testosterone, which is the male hormone, and also levels of LH are high for obvious reasons by the physiology. And the diagnosis is confirmed by doing a karyotype and you get it as an XY female. So what is the treatment? Of course, again, it's, it's again a lot of psychological support to tell somebody who's being reared till age of 18 or maybe 14, 15 when the diagnosis is made that you are a female to be told, look, now you are XY. So it is kind of a lot of, you know, psychological support because they have been, they have an identity crisis because they are known as females if they've grown in school and college or whatever they go and now they're told they're uh, XY. So we have a lot of girls whom we liaise with our psych psychology colleagues and psychiatrists to sort of get them over it. Uh, but the treatment there lies in doing a gonadectomy. You know, that's very important. Why? Because these gonads, if they are left in place, could be a source of concern. And the concern is that if by the third decade, so remember the formula, 30, until the age of 30, it's fine. But one third of them, 30% of them may develop a cancer in these uh, testicles if they are left until the age 30. So 30% 30 may develop it. So that's the formula. And therefore, what we do is we believe in doing a gonadectomy uh, by removing the gonads. So we are just removing the risk of a cancer developing. We've had patients who come to us. We have a whole series which we published. Uh, and there where the girls came with a gonadectomy. And when we did a gonadectomy, even earlier, before then, 30, they developed uh, uh, testicular tumors or testicular cancers in them. Now, how could this gonadectomy could be done? It could be done laparoscopically. Uh, when if it's lying in the abdominal cavity, just put in a scope and you can just do a, a, a gonadectomy. It's one of the easiest surgeries to do or, or and most simple and safe. Uh, when they're in lying in the inguinal canal, just simple surgery by giving an incision is enough. What's important is here that when you're removing the gonads, they're done away with it. They need some kind of hormone replacement therapy because their breast development, their skeletal growth is all dependent on the hormones which are coming from the testicle, i.e. from the testosterone, which gets peripheral conversion. And now, when you remove the gonad, this is missing. They definitely need a substitution. And the substitution is in the form of estrogen and progesterones because we want their breasts to continue growing or being maintained. And also, this, the bone, bone strength comes from uh, estrogen and progesterone. So that's how we manage them. So if you do a to mean this young girl, you have to send her on HRT, which would be almost lifelong. And of course, to complete the treatment is a psychological support, not just of the girl, but also of the parents, because I think they need a psychological support system, particularly in societies like ours. So as I said, uh, it's an overall incidence of 5 to 10%, but 30% if they are left in, into the age of um, uh, 30 years. So coming back again, so we've talked about the constitutional delay. Of course, we just have done the first section of the classification of primary amenorrhea convert the secondary sexual characters with a normal high uh, with a normal sexual difference. So we're moving on to the next group, which is secondary sexual characters are absent. And I will not be able to do a complete job because we are going to complete the second topic as well in secondary amenorrhea. So this is something where we need to do about the the the, the variance and therefore I will come here on to the disorders of ovary. And that's how we put it. So this is the group which I think which you should know as undergraduate uh, you should not, uh, can't complete this gonadal dysgenesis when there's incomplete or defective formation of the gonads. And therefore, the main cause of primary amenorrhea, uh, the main presentation or the most common presentation of primary amenorrhea in these patients is gonadal dysgenesis is a Turner syndrome. And I should, don't think I need to kind of reiterate this. You all would have read it in physiology, in endocrinology, shots, stature, webbing of neck, uh, you know, all this uh, low set tears, increased carrying angle, 
uh, occubitus valgus and all these features the whole uh, you know gamut of them is present i'm sure you all know this so the presentation is primary amenorrhea 15 percent begin but do not complete pubertal so there could be some who do have uh, no pubertal to mild pubertal and you know five percent is them who will have puberty and have menses and these are the ones who have menses are generally the turner mosaics now of course you have to screen them for cardiac defects they are increased risk of hypothyroidism hypertension and of course what's very peculiar you get an mcq is that they have they're intellectually normal in contrast to the other variants um, which could present with short stature uh, uh, and like the fragile x syndrome which presents similarly with a primary amenorrhea and a short stature so the diagnosis is basically in a karyotype and i think that's important i will just not complete this you can go on through the slides all these antibodies that have been mentioned, MRI for to rule out, uh, you know, uh, coarctation and echo, which has to be done because they have cardiovascular abnormalities. So um, uh, let's move on to the treatment. What's the treatment when they have uh, turners? Of course, it's growth hormones because their short stature could be helped if it's initiated early, i.e., between two to eight years. Uh, and of course, at times you give them a combination. This is all in the preview of a pediatric endocrinologist. Estrogens are definitely needed. But you can't give them just unopposed estrogens because they have a normal uterus in place. So you have to complete these estrogens cyclical with, uh, you know, my, uh, cyclical progesterones to have that they have a vaginal bleeding. Because unopposed estrogens could be a trouble in such girls because of the risk of developing ovarian uh, uterine malignancy if it goes for over the years. Now the other cause in ovarian is Y syndrome, a 46 X, X gonadal dysgenesis and premature ovarian insufficiency, i.e. premature or primary ovarian failure. And just to complete the list of savage. Now, the SWI syndrome is nothing but androgen insensitivity syndrome, AIS. That means an XY female, but she has a uterus. And we have a couple of patients who come to us uh, where we can help them, i.e. they can be, they are in a position to have a child. We have a child. I have one such patient who's following with me. Uh, we're giving her estrogen progesterone, continuing with her. We've removed the gonads, done a gonadotomy. Her uterus seems to be growing normal, and she is planning to have a baby through oocyte donation. So this is a married girl, woman who has had a SWI syndrome. Now, coming on to the next, you know, level or the next platform from the end organs, we've done about the ovary, uterus, ovaries, and as we move up, we're going up to the anterior pituitary. Now, anterior pituitary presentations are most, you know, remember, pituitary, if you get, a, if you go by causal kind of classifications, or by the level that pituitary causes are the ones which are generally generally responsible for secondary amenorrhea. They're very rare to cause primary amenorrhea, i.e. in somebody who has a micro or a macro edema. More commonly, these are causes for a secondary amenorrhea, i.e. the girl has had period and then she stops. Now, the causes are an empty cellar syndrome, pit infiltrating pituitary uh, lesions or a pituitary adenoma, and I would say they are rather lower down on the list when it comes of primary amenorrhea. I will skip this, it's a little not very clear slide, so we'll come straight to secondary amenorrhea, the other part, type of amenorrhea. Remember, you have to have this, uh, you know, hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis always uh, on your fingertips to understand that this works not just for primary, but also for a secondary. And therefore, if you look at it, I think secondary, the causes are much easier to remember. So if you go on the top system, the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis, it's either pituitary tumors or the Sheehan syndrome which are responsible as the pituitary causes and of course hypothalamic dysfunction which could be secondary unlike a primary uh, coming on to the uh, from there is the ovarian axis and the ovarian axis is the next there um, which is the premature ovarian failure that means ovaries are failing before the scheduled date of menopause also PCOS fits into secondary amenorrhea and of course when the ovaries are removed which is called a surgical a cause in an oophorectomy that you do for any cause like cancer or some other indication that will also lead to uh, amenorrhea. Now the outflow tract means is, is the end organs and these are typically seen when there's Asherman syndrome that means there is a uterus but the lining which is the endometrium is lost is totally destroyed destructive state and that's I'll tell in detail. To add this we have the endocrine control and that is other endocrine controls is in the secondary they could be androgen producing ovarian tumor which could uh, nullify the effect of estrogen progesterone or an adrenal tumor or a uh, hypothyroidism and Cushing. Now these are just to complete the risk, however they are less common to cause. So the most common etiology if we look at secondary amenorrhea could be somebody who has an ovarian disease, hypothalamic dysfunctions, pituitary disease, uterine disease and others. So if you look ovarian disorders are reigning highest in the etiologies and of the, uh, um, of, of the list here. I would say for secondary amenorrhea, 
is that if you look at the end organ uterine is Asherman syndrome or it could be cervical stenosis this is secondary so obviously that could be a surgery done on the cervix is lead to cervical stenosis and that could be the cause ovarian as I have right, rightfully told you it could be premature ovarian failures to reasons like genetic autoimmune or exposure to radiation chemotherapy but more common for ovarian is PCOS which is responsible for secondary amenorrhea and stands amongst the most most recognized causes of secondary amenorrhea and the hypothalamic of course I'll dwell in detail are the weight loss which is anorexia bulimia and the anorexia nervosa at times even psychological because when there's psychological stress girls go to have amenorrhea and the reason is hypothalamic pulses of the GnRH uh, are, are attenuated pituitary of course hyperprolactinemia uh, which could be because of uh, reasons including Sheehan syndrome or hypopituitarism uh, again hyperprolactinemia could be drug induced because a lot of drugs especially antipsychotic drugs that these uh, girls who are depressed have act on to increase the prolactin levels and I will tell you again in detail of course hypothalamopituitary damage can happen because of tumors because of radiations or head injuries so and of course to complete the list would be chronic illnesses and weight loss but mind you the chronic illness weight loss are again acting actually through the hypothalamic uh, you know system and of course whenever we do that to complete the list is Cushing's and thyroid so I think whenever you get a girl with or a woman with secondary amenorrhea like we did the check on the height in the secondary section here we just check on the pregnancy you could have somebody who's pregnant and you're thinking of pathology but pregnancy is the first thing that we do that means do a urine pregnancy test of course we always screen them for thyroid and prolactin and therefore doing a TSH and checking their prolactin levels is very important and then when you go on to the other sections or the other levels that could come a lot from history so this is what you can have in your slides but I'll move quickly to the causes of hypothalamic and you can see the pictures of a typical hypothalamic uh, you know cause of an anorexia nervosa uh, which in such situations you know one third of them have uh, amenorrhea and that's just the way they work now uh, the other cause of pituitary could be a pituitary failure that means uh, the pituitary is being knocked out and it happens in Sheehan syndrome and is a typical situation where there's massive blood loss postpartum and that leads to a, uteri a, a pituitary apoplexy or an infarction a, or it could be a pituitary tumor now the pituitary failure is, uh, causes there it's the supply gets knocked off or there's trauma to the pituitary or a tumor which is causing infarction but then there are pituitary tumors which actually work not by the knockdown but by the effect which is called as a pituitary tumor secreting high levels of prolactin and the hyperprolactinemia can cause secondary amenorrhea thyroid of course is there androgen secreting tumors are not very common but they do cause secondary amenorrhea in some so coming on to the anatomical causes for the uterus which is the end organ is somebody who has not a uterus the uterus removed and hysterectomy done will have uh, you know amenorrhea but the commoner one in our country is Asherman syndrome where there is a damage to the endometrium most commonly due to tubercular infection in our part of the world but also if there is an excessive surgery on the uterus i.e. there is an ablation of the endometrium therefore it leads to development of damage many times myomectomies which are done especially on submucous fibroids they can also cause Asherman syndrome additions developing secondary to a surgery but in India I think we must remember Asherman the most common cause is tuberculosis so what is Asherman syndrome I just thought I will just not talk each and every cause but come to very salient ones it's basically an end organ defect in which the uterus gets affected more so particularly the endometrium of the lining is development of sinecure bands which are fibrous bands which are bridging the uterine cavity the endometrium gets totally disruptive it's damaged and these girls the typical thing and I will come and talk about the flow chart that we have is that there is um, a, a, a way we work on them first uh, to check but typically if you give them uh, the urine pregnancy test is negative and if you give them a challenge that means if the woman is given progesterone she will not respond but if you give given a combination of estrogen progesterone she will not respond to having periods now that is the way we work if we have a secondary amenorrhea we check for pregnancy if that is negative we challenge them by giving progesterone tablets and once we stop progesterone if they bleed it is a clear indicator that the uterine endometrium acts level is perfectly normal but unlike a normal uterine endometrium uh, you know uh, the Asherman defect do not have a normal endometrium and therefore when you give them or you challenge this young woman with estrogen progesterone 
she will not be able to have a withdrawal bleeding that's a peculiar peculiar sign so that's a peculiar finding even before you jump on you can just get this uh, simple you know challenge test um, uh, before you even put them for an ultrasound or any other diagnostic modality you can even get a history of dncs uh, which is a very common thing she had multiple dncs uh, and termination of pregnancies and of course as i said tuberculosis is a very important history which you have to rule out they will have normal ovulatory cycles because ovaries are formed it's only the uterus which is defective uh, you can make a diagnosis typically on a transvaginal ultrasound i won't say hsd anymore but a transvaginal ultrasound is good enough and of course something which is very uh, simply to put is hysteroscopic treatment do a hysteroscopic uh, you know excision of these um, synechy but whatever said and done the surgery is not gratifying it's a very big disappointment because when there is a damage to the end organ just not by just not cutting the bands not cutting the synechy is not good enough because most of them show an end damage of the endometrium and if the endometrium is totally scarred and is totally lost it doesn't regenerate and if it doesn't regenerate they don't get their periods and again a very important in a fraction or maybe in the 30% of cases where they get back to periods they just have scanty periods but very important the endometrium is is far more important for implantation and therefore these girls are disappointingly uh send back because we can correct their periods but we can't correct their fertility and therefore surrogacy or uterine transplant if i can put it remains the only option for them if they want to have a baby now uh, the other etiology of secondary amenorrhea is coming from the uterus let's move to the ovaries and that is premature ovarian failure and uh, what do you mean by premature ovarian failure that means the girl had had periods and now she stopped having periods say she said for a couple of years she has periods and now she stops and this is when we call it it that means an ovaries which fail before the age of 40 years is what is called as premature ovarian failure or pof as we simply put it it could be following a a a a surgery or following a chemotherapy radiotherapy but in the vast majority we don't get any history of chemo radiation or any surgery on the ovaries and these are either idiopathic or autoimmune that means there's been to anti ovarian antibodies or for and these could be uh, one of the causes and again a disappointing situation because if the ovaries fail they will not produce the hormones there will be no development of the graafian follicles there will be no oocyte development and these girls are the ones who actually need and if to have periods you can give them estrogen and progesterone i e you can give exogenous hormones estrogen progesterone to have the uterus which is present normal normally present with a normal lining shed off the endometrium have periods but what's very important to give them babies is difficult and this group actually needs oocyte donation that means a donor oocyte program ivf is the only choice they have when it can, comes to primary ovarian or premature ovarian failure so what about uh, the the other level moving up from the uterus to the ovaries coming to the pituitary i think the commonest cause of pituitary is hyperprolactinemia and therefore as i said earlier if you have a pr- prolactin levels high you must always take a history of galactoria which is there because prolactin hormone leads to the galactoria amenorrhea syndrome which is there but very important you must always take a history of drugs and some of the drugs which are very very notorious to cause hyperprolactinemia are antipsychotic drugs if you go and go back are all the dopamine dopaminergic pathways that they act so if there is a girl who or a lady who has got amenorrhea the cause of high prolactin levels you must look at galactoria is a presentation and it's seen in about 40% of them uh the amenorrhea uh, could be uh, the other thing that you have to do in their testing is also thyroid because tsh and the thyroid and the prolactin levels so if they have high prolactin levels we do not go them send them without doing the tsh levels because many times the thy- hypothyroid could be the cause of the amenorrhea and you correct one automatically the prolactin levels come back to normal now if there is a significant hyperprolactinemia ie if it's a level more than 80 miu per liter then And, and you can't explain it with you know just drugs or simple things then you must always go in simply to scan the pituitary and the best scanning methodology is an mri scan and so i would just already put you besides the antidepressant there are some antihypertensive and even metoclopramide is a cause of amenorrhea which we give for patients with nausea and vomiting so i really won't tell you the detail how it acts the mechanism is through the uh, high levels causing low levels of fsh and lrh and these are the ones which are leading cause of a uh, thing so the treatment of uh, hyperprolactinemia is simply giving them dopaminergic 
agents which is dopamine agonist and the form of cabagolin or bromocriptine and of course cabagolin is the one which we prefer also if there is a pituitary adenoma this also needs treatment by giving a uh, form of cabagolin uh, the, the, the goals of treatment here would be to sort of get them to uh, a level which is uh, checking the uh, prolactin levels which were abnormal However, it's a macroadenoma, then surgery remains because we've seen transphenoidal resection of the pituitary is commonly done, and that's a procedure which corrects the macroadenoma and also the hyper, uh, high levels of prolactin. Now, uh, again, a patient with macroadenoma, something which has to be that the response to radiation can be very slow, so she may need to be put on, besides the surgery, also an oral contraceptive pills. Because why? We know that when the prolactin is getting, the surgery is done, the prolactin levels may take time to come back to normal and therefore this is very important. So that is something which one has to counsel young girls who are going and uh, young women who are going for a surgery for macroadenoma. So coming on to the other ovarian cause here, I just thought I would just, I'm just jumping back and forth, but I thought I could not complete the ovarian list without talking of PCOS. PCOS accounts for presentation and I know it is a typical syndrome or triad as teen Leventhal had said of amenorrhea, obesity, subfertility and hirsutism but then uh, that is just I'm sure you'll have a detailed lecture on that. Now when you have a patient or a young girl with secondary amenorrhea I think it's primarily to assess her, do a history examination and investigations. So what is a history? Uh, the history can give you a lot of information and what you have to ask in the history is what, what age she started and what was her prior menstrual history going to say if she's had any pregnancies and if the pregnancies result in PPH because these are something which are always there in a Paris if there's a history of a lot of weight loss uh, if there is uh, heart clashes if there is a decreased libido they could point down to premature menopause or premature ovarian failure in some medications of course the list I've already said relevant to hyperlactinemia if she's on contraceptive because there's an entity called the uh, post pill amenorrhea and again the post pill amenorrhea also works through the prolactin pathways and uh, associate symptoms which could suggest of Cushing's or hypothyroidism. Again, if there is any gynecological surgery, are you on the ovaries, like we do extensive surgery, repeated surgeries on the ovaries for endometriosis, her ovarian, uh, you know, tissue is completely lost, that's something very relevant, and of course, any chronic illness. And I think to this, I should also add relevant to ovarian failure history of any chemo radiation as well. Now, on the examination, what you need to check, check for their body mass index, of course, if they are anorexic blood pressures, do look in for any androgen excess because PCOS could present with hirsutism also androgen secreting tumors uh, could give you nothing but uh, um, in excessive body hair. Secondary sexual characters are important. Breast examination may reveal you a galactoria here because galactoria is present in one third of cases of hyperprolactinemia. Also look for any pelvic masses. I put in hematometra here and this is something when you have a surgery done in for the cervical stenosis and that presents with a big collection in the uterus of blood because the end organ is working. And of course, inspect is for a cervical stenosis. Now, history examination gives you a lot of lead and can you can give you some directions. Some patients you can get a history but then it's not complete. You may not get any of this history. You may not get a complete examination findings and also even if you do get, you need to complete them with some investigation which include hormone analysis. And as I said, when we do manage them, the first thing we do is put them on a progesterone challenge test because the progesterone challenge test is giving the girl tablets of progesterone, which we give in the OPD basis, give them 10 milligrams of medroxyprogesterone acetate for five days and tell them to come back after one week because this progesterone challenge gives us clarity at what is the level. Because if the hypothalamopituitary ovarian axis is intact, or for that matter, if, the, if she responds to the progesterone challenge test that means the uterus is working the endometrium is intact and therefore this is indicative of a, a, a deficiency in progesterone and progesterone challenge test responding patients are typically the PCOS patients so they are the ones where the ovaries are functioning but because there's disturbed hormone levels they are the ones who yield in response to progesterone challenge the best of course you need to complete the investigation and the investigation which are part of the game are doing a TSH levels we also do an FSH LH because there will be somebody who will respond to the progesterone or the estrogen progesterone challenge but show you high levels of FSH LH. And these high LH of LH levels of FSH LH are indicative of basically uh, a hypergonadotrophic hypogonadism, i.e. primary ovarian or, or, or premature ovarian failure. Of course, prolactin levels have to be done with. 
So as I said, the progesterone challenge is giving them a progesterone 10 milligram. I would say not 10 days, 5 days is good enough. So if the bleeding occurs, that means there is no outflow tract obstruction. If there is no bleeding, you have to move a step ahead by giving them estrogen and progesterones. And the estrogens generally we give them as, uh, you know, I would like to say here we were giving 0.65 to 2.5 milligrams. We generally give them even shorter. We would just, I would like to edit the slide here. We now give them 2 milligrams of estrogen valerate, estradiol valerate, which is more easily available, cheaper for 21 days, maybe 21 to 28 days, and then give them followed by 10 days of medroxyprogesterone. If there is no bleeding, that means the uterus is not functional. And this could be meaning of an Asherman syndrome. So an E, e plus P challenge, if it fails to occur, it is indicative of a Asherman syndrome. So simply do a pregnancy test, put in them for a uh, progesterone challenge. If the progesterone bleeds, she's simply an ovulation. That means she's pointing to a PCOS. That's the first diagnosis. If there's no withdrawal bleeding to estrogen, uh, to just the progesterone, put them on the estrogen progesterone. If there is no bleed, it is basically uh, a case of an Asherman syndrome. And that is where the E plus P challenge test is negative. That means there is an outflow tract, means the end organ is damaged. And what these girls will have is, uh, these women will have will, will have a normal FSH levels because their levels are normal. I think this is a very simple flow diagram which you can use, and it's handy. That's how we do it. Suppose you have no bleeding with an estrogen progesterone, uh, with the progesterone challenge, you put them on E plus P, they are not bleeding and they have high levels of FSH, they are pointing off. In fact, the ones who have an ovarian failure, on the contrary, would actually respond to an EMP. Whereas uh, Asherman's would not respond because you know an ovarian failure, it's the ovaries which have failed. The uterus is normal. So if you give them high doses or uh, even with high FSH, you give them doses of estrogen progesterone, uh, like the uh, 21 days of estrogen and 10 days of progesterone, their uteruses start responding. And that's the way we treat these girls to have them cyclical periods. But mind you, because their FSH is very high, the ovaries have failed, the ultimate treatment in terms of fertility is only oocyte donation. So let's move on to evaluation and hyperandrogenism. Of course, this is what you do. This is what I will kind of skip it off. This is typically a slide for a PCOS girl. Ovarian failure is premature menopause, and these girls' uh, causes could be autoimmune or chromosomal, and the chromosomal uh, is, uh, uh, 30, is a woman under 30, character up should be present because they could have uh, y uh, chromosome mosaicism and therefore if Y is found it's important to do karyotype because in that case you have to remove the gonads. Autoimmune of course it may make sense but then we do not know how many of them would give you parathyroid or uh, 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 would give you anti-ovarian antibodies but yes if you screen them for thyroid parathyroid these women would need replacement for thyroid uh, 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 hormones. Now uh, Coming on to the pituitary ovarian failure access at that level which occurs, patients do not bleed after progesterone, who do not bleed and who do bleed after estrogen progesterone, these are the typical ones where they'll have low or very low levels of SH and LH. So this is an investigation that you need to have women where you have a hypothalamic pituitary cause, send their FSH levels, let them have their prolactin. So you can just see if the hypothalamic involvement is there like an anorexia nervosa, she'll have low levels of both FSH, LH and estradiol. If it's a pituitary adenoma or a Sheehan's, she'll have uh, high levels of prolactin typically in pituitary adenoma. The FSH LH could be low, but in Sheehan's, remember, it's the failure of the pituitary because of loss of blood supply. So the, all the FSH LH and estrogen are low. Of course, we're completing the, the workup by doing a TSH, also in girls who have galactoria because hypothyroidism can be a cause. And if it is a PCOS, you will have a normogonadotrophic normogonadism. In a PCOS, the FSH LH are normal. In contrast to ovarian pathology where there is premature ovarian failure, the FSH, LH are high and so are the E2 level. In contrast to Asherman's where everything is normal, the, e, the, the, the FSH, LH, the prolactin, the TSH are all normal. What is very typical is that they do not respond to estrogen progesterone challenge test. So what is the treatment? In, in, in secondary amenorrhea, the treatment is treating the cause. You find the cause, you treat it. And of course, you have not just to give them, the issue is not giving them regular periods. A lot of these women, the issue is on their fertility. So that's something which is very important, of course. Besides that, you may th have to need to think of giving them a contraception. So those who are trying to conceive, if it's an ovulation or a PCOS, just give them ovulation induction agents. They do simply, uh, that's a whole chapter in itself. Prolactinemia, give them 
dopamine agonist. If it's hypothalamic dysfunction, you have to know what is the cause of hypothalamic treated. If it's in Asherman's, the picture is sad in terms of fertility, but yes, they do get periods if they are mild variants of Asherman's. Now, the ones who want regular periods, and this is when we're talking of a PCOS patient or somebody who responds to E plus P, you can put them on oral pills for the long term, and that's the way it works. And somebody who's got PCOS but wants to have contraception also, then oral pills again work wonder. So OC pills are actually a treatment in terms of ovarian causes, including ovarian failures, and also in terms of women who are having PCOS. Uh, so I think I will just not go. I think this this can be just looked up. I think we are shooting time. Bankar de lecture. Okay, so I think this is a second part of my chapter, and I think I should, we should go to and have a revision because this whole chapter itself needs so much talking on hirsutism, which is the second part. It's basically moving from amenorrhea to the other topic, um, is having an excessive gra growth on the female with the male type pattern, and virilization is extreme variant, which actually represents a very high level of androgens or an androgen secreting tumor. Now, what is the etiolo etiology of this excess androgen? It is could be either the hormone is getting excessively produced or the hormone is is levels are normal but the levels of SHBG which is the binding globulin are low and therefore the effective level of the circulating hormone increases uh, in some situations as in PCOS when the SHBG levels are low or there is an excessive sensitivity to androgens and that has happened what is called as idiopathic parasitism where the levels of SHBG are normal the levels of testosterone are normal and sometimes the end organs are also excessively responsive. So these are the causes. It could be ovarian is PCOS, hypertrichosis or tumors, adrenals is Cushing, CH and tumors. Peripheral means it's the end organs, which could be idiopathic, some drugs, and of course, uh, uh, others like hypothyroidism, acromegaly, hyperprolactinemia are also uh, associated. So when and how, um, uh, uh, how should you evaluate if it's first or second drug history, I'll tell you. If there are other endocrinopathies and important, just take their uh, menstrual history and other symptoms. So, by mean when and how was it before or after puberty? How means if they had it during pregnancy? It is very common she had hyper uh, excessive hair growth during pregnancy, and this goes away. How again if she's menopausal? Then first or second means if. If it's 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 like congenital adrenal hyperplasia or idiopathic, let's look at the drug history and a lot of drugs are there, which is there in the list. I'm sure you can take it from the slide. I won't dwell in detail, but this is what is there. Uh, again, other endocrinopathy, hypothyroidism, hyperplactinemias, menstrual histories if they have history of uh, prolonged periods or second uh, of secondary amenorrhea, then you think of and uh, either PCOS or uh, androgen secreting tumors. If the other symptoms like a lump or galactoria or uh, pain in abdomen. So what is the examination you have? Look at the BMIs, waist hip ratio, uh, BP. These are all something which could give you some pointers to associated uh, with PCOS. Of course, the, the derm derma examination is very important to look in for excessive response to the androgen could be in acne, if there's uh, loss of hair, which is alopecia. Typically a temporal alopecia fo follows because of the excess and of course, if there is hyperacanthosis, which is uh, acanthosis negligence, darkening of the hair, this is basically seen in women with PCOS, which would actually indicate or reflect hyperinsulinemia. So of course, when you examine, you have to exclude out, you know, between an hyperandrogenism and virilization by just looking at for clitoris or deepening of voice, because this basically suggests exceptionally high levels of androgens, and this could be uh, indicative of tumors. Uh, also looking for, you know, features of Cushing's and acromegaly, of course, hypothyroidism has to be. Uh, pelvic examination may be necessary only if there are some, you know, of, uh, you know, uh, patients are presenting with uh, uh, virilization or amenorrhea because you want to rule out tumors. So this is the Feldman gallery which is modified score, which is given a score of mild, or if it's 8 to 15, if it's more than 15, is moderate or severe, and that's what is there. You can just look at the um, uh, nine points that are looking in the modified um, uh, Feynman Galway, which are sites which are looked in. Of course, besides getting for a Feynman Galway score, you have to look in for investigation. Uh, you have to look in for, uh, uh, you know, tachomegaly, obesity, menstrual irregularities, and acanthesis. This is just the coma, which is a short mnemonic, uh, where which you could look in because this could indicate severity. Now, uh, these are the levels. Again, you could go back to the slides. I will not dwell. This is something which I've taken from the books, uh, just levels of 
hormones that are needed for us to know the testosterone, free testosterone, because it's important to know the free testosterone. Now, basically, again, SHBG levels and free testosterone are there, and most um, uh, you know societies say what should be the right uh, method should be ELISA, should be by RIA or whatever. But I think when it comes to free testosterone, uh, these are some things which have to be really looked in. So there are standard guidelines and what lab and how to measure. Um, and uh, then imaging is useful if you suspect malignancy. Uh, TVS may be simple, but if it's an MRI, may be needed if you are suspecting of uh, a pr prolactin or a pituitary tumor. So the treatment is, is, is again directed to the cause. You have to treat if you judge. And of course, you need cosmetic measures. Uh, it's a three-pronged approach. Lifestyle changes for somebody who's PCOS, weight loss is very important. Suppress the source or site of um, androgen production. And of course, of course, mechanical removal. So again, OC pills are the first line therapy. The way they act is very well known. I won't again go in detail. OC pills are what we choose is we prefer giving them, uh, you know, the ones which are the newer androgenic uh, uh, ones where the progesterone is of a low progesterone component is very low in androgenic activity is Yasmin and the other non-estimate and desodestrols. Femilon is the one which is available in India, so is Yasmin. And of course, you have to take care of the side effects. Now, the other thing is anti-androgens, where you could use them at two sites. It means either they block the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, and again, the ones which act to, because the DHT, the dihydrotestosterone, which is the active hormone, the active form of testosterone, goes on to act at the androgen receptors. Now, that's the way they work. So if you look at the ones which act to inhibit the conversion of the uh, pathways from testosterone, DHT is finasteride and spir uh, spironolactone, and the ones which are acting to inhibit at the receptor levels are again CPA, cyproptyron acetate, glutamide, and spironolactone. Now, CPA is one of the choicest drugs which is not available standalone in India, but we do get a combination of CPA with OC in, in estrogen combination pills in the form of diene, which is we commonly used in these girls. Um, and uh, the very important thing is you have to make sure that when you're giving it to young girl, you must, if you give standalone androgens, you have to give them an OC pill because if it is used without um, a contraception, it could lead to feminization of a male fetus. So again, I will not talk in detail. Spinalactone is not anymore, just to complete the list, it's not a very preferred dose because it's milder form. Uh, then uh, it comes as aldecton and it's what we use. CPA is what is preferred. Uh, it comes in the name of Androcure. Uh, it has got its um, uh, usage here, but again, we get it in the form of diene in India. The others are finasteride and flutamide. I'm sure you can read it from your pharma or maybe go through the slides. Now, about mechanical dye, you know, is very important. So the recent in derma is definitely laser hair removal, and that's where I will end. Thank you very much. Questions? Sorry, you think? Questions? I think. If you if you have any questions, I don't know how it's a two-way or a one-way lecture or dialectic. If I'm sure if you have any questions, I really don't know if there's any mechanism of answering the question. Thank you very much. Yeah, recording hoga yogi na? Yeah. 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 Yeah.